Thank you very much for that uh, very generous introduction. And, uh, it's, um, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, yeah, as, as was mentioned, I was um, involved in another uh, Mary Curie doctoral training network called CH Europe. Um, and uh, it's been good to hear a little bit about, um, a little bit more about this one and people's experiences working on this one. And, and I'm looking forward to hearing even further uh, in the uh, discussions which follow. Uh, and it's just nice to be in the room with people face to face. Uh, yeah, so very nice to see you all and uh, really nice to have this opportunity to speak to you about some of these projects, uh, a series of collaborative projects which talk to this theme of um, rethinking heritage in museums for climate action. <clears throat> so while much consideration is currently being given to the current and potential future impacts of climate change on aspects of cultural heritage, and significant efforts are underway to mitigate those impacts, one could argue that these responses are somewhat like fiddling while Rome burns. And by this I mean that the heritage sector has largely responded to the threat of climate change with a renewed sense of moral purpose to continue to do what it's always done, to document, to collect, to plan, to manage, to conserve, even in the face of what we now know to be a planetary emergency which renders such approaches potentially meaningless and trivial. In contrast, this paper aims to explore the potential for heritage in museums to become agents for radical forms of climate action and to find alternatives to present practices. So a flurry of recent policy documents and reports point to the ways in which what my former PhD student, Jana Ud Amerwald, refers to as an authorized climate heritage discourse has settled upon the sector. This statement from the ICOMAS, ICOMOS report on the future of our past is typical of such documents, emphasizing the heightened risks to the historic environment caused by climate change and the need to adapt to these changes. But can we imagine forms of cultural heritage practice which work with rather than against inevitable ecological, climatological and or social changes? What might such a form of heritage practice which moves beyond the tropes of endangerment and rescue look like? and what benefits might it bring. So this talk draws on several recent international collaborative research projects which aim to address the role of heritage organizations and conservation practices in supporting action for climate and in realizing more sustainable futures. These projects have been characterized by collaborative partnerships with the heritage sector organizations and other actors which have sought to, and they've sought to intervene not only critically but also practically in the role of natural and cultural heritage preservation within the climate and extinction crises. And they've done so by engaging organizations and publics as co-researchers in the research process and in aiming to rethink the conscious practical role of heritage in building distinctive future worlds. So the first project I'd like to begin with is Heritage Futures. And some of you may have heard me speak about this project before, um, but if you haven't, Heritage Futures was a four-year collaborative international research program funded by the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council uh, and supported additionally by its host universities and, and various uh, partner organizations. And the research program involved ambitious interdisciplinary research to explore the, the potential for innovation and creative exchange across a broad range of heritage and related fields or domains of practice in partnership with a number of academic and non-academic institutions and interest groups. It was distinctive in its comparative approach, which aimed to bring heritage conservation practices of many different kinds into closer dialogue with the management of other material and discursive, uh, sorry, material and virtual legacies, such as nuclear waste management. And it was also distinctive in its exploration of different forms of heritage as distinctive future-making practices. The project involved an international and interdisciplinary project team composed of 16 researchers, each of whom worked across one or more of our four main themes in collaboration with our 25 odd academic and non-academic partner organizations. And, and indeed our advisory um, board on which Francesco, uh, who spoke this morning, Bandarin was uh, a member of that board, uh, Francesco. Um, so the... Empirically, the project drew on the results of comparative research with uh, this range of organizations, which represent a diverse range of interests in the preservation or conservation of natural and cultural heritage. 
and our research collaborators included museums and museum professional organizations, endangered language documentation programs, cultural heritage and protected area site management agencies, frozen zoo, herbaria, seed banks, botanical gardens, and land landscape rewilding projects, to name a few, as well as a range of government and non-governmental organizations tasked with representing the interests of natural and cultural heritage preservation in a number of different ways. And as I mentioned, we also worked across fields that are not conventionally understood as heritage fields or domains, such as nuclear waste disposal and extraterrestrial communication initiatives, which we felt shared certain objectives with heritage practices and might be productively brought into conversation with them. And we worked across multiple sites of engagement with these organizations in around a dozen different countries to collect the empirical material on which the project's uh, final findings and monograph draw. Central to the project was this idea that futures are not simply emergent. They don't just happen, but they're designed. And what I mean by this is that futures are built and assembled as a result of actions in the present, which are formed out of particular constellations of things, persons, places, and practices, and they're coming together in conflict or in collaboration with one another at particular moments in time. And we use the term conservation very broadly to refer to the maintenance of plants, animals, languages, practices, ideas, persons, things, traces, residues, and materials from the past in the present for the future. And we often hear this claim made for heritage as being something from the past which is conserved for or on behalf of future generations. But most importantly, we saw that different forms of conservation practices often work towards assembling quite different and quite divergent futures and future worlds. And in doing so, they have the potential to undermine or come into conflict with one another. So the project asked its partner organizations to think through the different kinds of futures which they were involved in producing within their own organizations, through their own specific conservation practices, and to explore how they might relate to others. And in this sense, the project aimed to encourage its partners to develop shared, integrated responses to common problems, many of which touch on issues of uh, global concern. Our methods drew broadly on uh, different forms of ethnography, visual, archaeological material, but also incorp incorporated documentary research, creative artistic practice, ethnographic filmmaking, and creative knowledge exchange. And our work here has been strongly influenced by the uh, forms of experimental, collaborative, paraethnographic practices which have characterized anthropological approaches to the contemporary, and I'm thinking here particularly of the work of uh, Holmes and Marcus, in which ethnographers come together with other expert knowledge producers in the development of shared critical insights which cut across the fields in which we work. And to do this, we facilitated a series of inter and intra thematic, uh, what we call thought experiments, collaborative knowledge exchange events in which the researchers and members of the various partner organizations with, with which we worked came together around field vi visits and collaborative workshops to explore shared questions relating to futures, world making, and creative engagements with ruin and environmental change. Uh, these included a range of different kinds of activities from collective visits to explore archival architectures at the site of the long-term nuclear waste repository, which is currently being built uh, in Forsmark in Sweden, to thought experiments relating to the different ordering and welding practices across the various collections at the uh, Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew in London, to discussions of natural and cultural heritage transformation in context of climate-related coastal change on the Suffolk coast. Conceptually, the project was strongly influenced by the ontological turn, or what's been termed the ontological turn in the social sciences, in particular Karen Barad's agential realism and various aspects of science and technology studies in seeing heritage practices of various kinds as enacting new realities through contingent practices of assembling and reassembling bodies, techniques, technologies, materials, values, temporalities, and spaces in particular ways. And central here is a plural notion of what we term heritage ontologies, understood as the world-making, future-assembling capacities of heritage practices of different kinds, and the ways in which different heritage practices might be seen to enact different realities 
and hence hold the potential to assemble radically different future worlds. In looking across the range of professional fields which are implicated in promulgating such practices, the project sought to make a specific contribution to current discussions relating to the value of comparison in the humanities and social and historical sciences, expanding them to the study of human and non-human collectives. And we did this because we feel that a comparative analysis of different kinds of natural and cultural heritage conservation and preservation practices might develop and open up the notion of heritage in creative and productive ways, and also help us to explore what uh, social and material and political uh, work is facilitated by doing heritage, uh, which I see as a fundamental goal of heritage studies as a field of critical research. And through a focus on conservation or preservation as a series of distinctive, creative, and dialogical engagements between human and non-human persons, objects, places, practices, we aim to explore heritage as a series of distinctive processes rather than the end products of such practices or indeed simply as the values associated with those end products. And through this new emphasis on heritage as forms of value, uh, of inheritance which may be positively, negatively, or even ambiguously valued, we aimed to bring the field of critical heritage studies into conservation with the study of hyper objects and other Anthropocene legacies such as waste and climate. Uh, and in the uh, jointly authored open access monograph, which was uh, produced at the end of the project, we argue that a, a reframed notion of heritage as material and discursive legacy will allow us to move beyond the uncritical valorizing of certain objects, places, and practices from the past to re reorient heritage studies more explicitly as a study of future making or welding practices by showing how things and the practices by which they're realized form templates for the organization of new contingent realities and the construction of divergent future worlds. Working across natural and cultural heritage, the work was informed by Chakrabarti's observation of the ways in which research in what we, we might term the climate change era um, forces a dissolution between this distinction between natural and cultural history. And here we also intersect with a new critical engagement with nature conservation and extinction studies in exploring the distinctive social and cultural frameworks which produce natural heritage the ways in which cultural heritage is not outside, but integrally a part of these practices. Our work also con connects both conceptually and empirically with recent anthropological engagements with futures and with current creative academic engagements with global climatological and environmental change. And I'm thinking here of uh, the work of Anna Singh and colleagues, for example. And as I said, the, the findings of this project are presented here in this open access volume, which is able to be downloaded at the link. Um, so one of the projects that developed out of Heritage Futures is a, a project called Landscape Futures and the Challenge of Change Towards Integrated Cultural and Natural Heritage Decision Making. Uh, and this project developed out of Heritage Futures findings that in coming decades, the need to adapt to and mitigate accelerated environmental change will require heritage and landscape managers to make difficult decisions about how to manage assets and allocate resources and to seek new models for conservation and management practice for both natural and cultural heritage. So the assertion that heritage assets are irre irreplaceable has traditionally underpinned a commitment by the heritage sector to protect such assets from cultural and biophysical processes that may cause damage or loss of historic fabric. Many heritage stakeholders are now coming to appreciate that in some contexts, promises of continued protection may be unsustainable and the sector is beginning to consider how to respond when change is inevitable or when conservation at current levels is not feasible. So new strategies are required for sensitive, proactive management of heritage transformations, particularly in places like vulnerable coastal landscapes and for assets already in an advanced state of decline. The Landscape Futures and the Challenge of Change project thus aimed to respond directly to the challenge that accelerated climate and environmental change poses for the natural and cultural heritage sector. Led by Professor Caitlin De Silvia at the University of Exeter and working collaboratively with colleagues from the National Trust, Historic England and Natural England and in consultation with a wider network of practitioners, the project aimed to develop and disseminate a new framework for heritage decision making 
and resource the UK heritage sector to engage with long-term thinking and respond to challenges more effectively and creatively. And importantly, it included researchers from the National Trust and Historic England as co-investigators rather than simply as uh, research partners, which is often the case in such projects. And, and it did so because it really aimed to embed its findings directly into policy and practice. So uh, current options for managing inevitable change in the historic environment due to external risks and hazards are often framed around largely negative terminology. So here we see uh, the Historic Environment Scotland um, approach to increasing resilience of historic assets. I don't know if I have a pointer. And um, we see a sort of range of different intervention options that sort of end in this, this one down at the bottom called Manage Loss. And similarly, for the, um, in the Historic uh, England guidelines, the, the terminology is, is around managed decline. Uh, and in, importantly, these decisions appear in instances where um, the significance is not such to that it, um, it kind of merits uh, intervening. You know, so, so these are options that are considered to um, present themselves only for the, the sort of least significant heritage assets, things that are not worth conserving. And, and the other thing is that there's generally a, a fairly significant lack of detail about what happens, what we've been calling it below the line, what happens in this area here and here. Um, you know, how, how does one actually manage loss uh, appropriately? How does one manage the decline of resources? Uh, what management actions are required? You know, obviously preservation by record, but what happens after that? Um, and, and we felt in this project we really wanted to focus on this area and see what options there were for uh, more creative, perhaps um, uh, more interesting approaches that might actually make sense of these areas, which we see as increasing, uh, increasingly significant in, in the light of the climate emergency. So um, drawing on interviews and workshops undertaken with a range of heritage practitioners and policy makers, the project developed the concept of adaptive release as an alternative management strategy that supports the transformation of heritage assets when other lower impact conservation options are not viable. Adaptive release presents an alternative management strategy that supports the transformation of heritage assets. Oh, sorry, I've repeated myself. So central to this approach is a focus on understanding how discrete assets are connected to wider processes of landscape change and continuity. The core working principles of adaptive release emphasize integration between historic and natural environmental planning and regulation, and a commitment to shared goals and outcomes across the sector. And it's only by taking such an integrated approach that adaptive release can deliver both cultural and natural heritage benefits and help build resilience at a landscape scale. Importantly, it's not a pathway to neglect, but rather reflects an active commitment to work with natural processes while sustaining uh, the values of different forms of natural and cultural heritage. Adaptive release requires ongoing meaningful engagements with local communities, stakeholders, and interest groups. Historic and natural environmental expertise will be needed to support the identification and interpretation of the new values and interests that emerge from places that are subject to such uh, a management regime. And adaptive management structures will be needed to provide set decision points for assessment of resource availability and monitoring of data. Uh, and, and importantly, the application of an adaptive release approach will differ depending on the asset in question and the landscape and the specific social and economic and historical and political context in which it sits. So there isn't one, a one-size-fits-all approach, even for assets that are ostensibly very similar to one another. So I mentioned that it, it requires thinking at a landscape scale. This means thinking beyond the site or the asset to consider the wider landscape setting and character and uh, understanding change in individual assets as linked to wider patterns and processes of change in the landscape. And I've also mentioned it requires thinking of natural and historic and uh, natural and cultural environments in combination rather than in isolation from one another. This means being attentive to how processes of change can result in enhanced opportunities for understanding emergent natural and cultural heritage values, and working across natural and historic environmental areas of expertise and regulation to identify opportunities for integrated management and interpretation. 
And in the project, we, we argue that it's only through taking such an, an integrated approach that, that it'll really work. Uh, and um, there are a number of resources from the project that are available here at this link. And the other thing that I didn't mention where we're looking to put this into um, further practice is a series of um, natural and cultural heritage management guidelines, which I'm currently collaborating with uh, Council of Europe on developing, which will be uh, released later this year, which aims to push forward this idea of sort of integrated landscape planning uh, within a European context. Um, so I now want to turn um, to a third and final collaborative project, um, which I've been involved in, which I colleague with my colleague Colin Sterling, who's here this evening from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, in collaboration with Henry McGee, curating tomorrow, and uh, Emma Woodham and colleagues at the Glasgow Science Centre, which aims aimed to collaborate with a range of actors outside of the heritage and museum sector in reimagining the futures of museums and heritage. So this project, Reimagining Museums for Climate Action, began life as a de design and ideas competition launched for International Museums Day in 2020. Responding to the two main pillars of climate action, mitigation and adaptation, the competition asked how museums could help society make the deep transformative changes needed to achieve a net zero or zero carbon world. Rather than focus on a specific location or type of museum, the competition invited proposals that aimed to unsettle and subvert the very foundations of museological thinking to support and encourage meaningful climate action. We specifically asked for design and concept proposals that were radically different from the traditional museum or that explored new ways for traditional museums to operate. And the, the responses which could address any aspect of museum design and activity ranged from the fantastical to the highly practical. Competition closed on the 15th of September 2020 and attracted over 500 expressions of interest and more than 250 formal submissions from almost 50 different countries. Working with the Glasgow Science Centre and our uh, team of international judges, eight teams were invited to develop their proposals for an exhibition at Glasgow Science Centre, uh, the official green zone for COP26 last September. I'm just going to show you some slides from some of the submissions that we received, um, which were subsequently developed into uh, exhibits within the exhibition itself. So the exhibition featured proposals from Brazil, Indonesia, Singapore, United States, and the United Kingdom. Uh, they ranged, the exhibits ranged from interactive models to concept designs to apps and short films, and including the short film Elephant in the Room, produced by Design Earth and featuring Donna Haraway as its narrator. And the global scope of these proposals shows that uh, museums have an important role to play, or at least there's a perception that museums have an important role to play, in addressing climate change at the international level, tailored to their local context, and the ambition from both outside and within the sector to reimagine museums to address complex contemporary problems. Um, so here are a series of pictures of the exhibition itself, which were, were sort of framed around a kind of core set of provocative questions. Um, and this is the, the website for the project, which um, collects all of the, the resources uh, in open access, if anyone's interested in taking a look, uh, including the Mobilising Museums for Climate Action toolbox uh, for museums and the Reimagining Museums for Climate Action edited volume, which is a sort of extended catalogue for the, the project and the exhibition. Uh, and this is the, the venue for the exhibition uh, when it was taken over by COP26 Green Zone. Um, so the exhibition was accompanied by a series of events and activities, both online and in person, a series of side events during COP26, um, the Museums and Climate Toolkit and the exhibition book that I mentioned. Um, and we have this year been running a series of national and international workshops with a range of partners uh, including ICOM, uh, Tate Plus, the Association of Independent Museums and various others, to promote and encourage practitioners to use the toolkit during this final year of uh, the UK's COP presidency 
and details of the workshops are also available on our project website and Twitter. And these are some of the um, activities that we staged during COP26 within the green zone where we're asking visitors to also uh, come up with their own ideas about how museums might facilitate meaningful climate action for them and the forms of climate action that they wish to take. So this is a kind of view from the exhibition across to the blue zone, um, which was held on the other side of the, the river. So what have we learned from the project and from COP26 on the role of museums in uh, and heritage in climate action? Enabling, empowering, and mobilizing public action on climate will be crucial to the goal of maintaining global heating at or below 1.5 degrees and to reimagining and recreating a net zero or zero carbon world. The Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement both recognize the crucial importance of involving the public in climate action. They both specify the importance of public education, training of key groups of staff, public awareness campaigns, public participation in climate change decision making, public access to information relating to science and policy regarding climate change, and international cooperation to facilitate these. And these six areas are known informally as Action for Climate Empowerment, or ACE. The submissions that we receive from the ideas competition and the work that we've done with and around the exhibition, as well as the discussions we had at COP itself, show that museums have incredible potential both to communicate but also, and perhaps more importantly, to become facilitators for real and radical forms of climate action. So museums and universities actually are um, specifically named as key institutions to facilitate public participation in climate action in the 10-year Glasgow Work Programme on Action for Climate Empowerment. And this is something that we were particularly involved in following and contributing to uh, at COP26 as a project team. And the Glasgow Work Programme reconfirms the key role that a broad range of stakeholders, such as national and subnational governments, educational and cultural institutions, the private sector, international and non-government uh, organisations, play in implementing action for climate empowerment. And it promotes cooperation, collaboration and partnerships amongst diverse stakeholders. So um, I came away from COP thinking that museums and heritage, this heritage sector more generally, have um, a really significant role to play in facilitating new forms of climate action. But we would argue that to do this uh, fully and effectively, museums and the heritage sector need to do a number of things, to change in a number of different ways. So in our museums toolkit, we developed as, as part of this project, um, the full title is Mobilizing Museums for Climate Action, Tools, Frameworks, and Opportunities to Accelerate Climate action in and with museums, and it's authored by uh, Henry McGee. We propose five practical pathways to climate action. These include reducing emissions in museums, supporting society to reduce emissions, ensuring museums are fit for the future to adapt to climate change, supporting society's adaptation, and ensuring that climate action is fair and contributes to broader so uh, sustainable development goals. Um, and I think these can be generalized to the sector more generally. But these practical goals can only really be achieved by taking further action to rethink the roles of museums and heritage in society. And to this end, there are another five ways which I would suggest uh, museums and uh, heritage institutions more generally need to fundamentally change to reimagine themselves for climate action. So firstly, they need to reckon with their histories and how those histories continue to play out in the present as ongoing discussions around things like the restitution of Benin bronzes and other colonial looted objects show, museums and heritage institutions more generally need to take a critical look at their histories and the role that the narratives that they've produced, uh, narratives of human exceptionalism, hierarchical understandings of human cultures, and an emphasis on progress and civilization have underpinned and helped to produce the current climate crisis. Secondly, they need to rapidly decarbonize um, and here is a sort of picture of the touring exhibition, which is something that's incredibly carbon intensive. And this means benchmarking success for the sector differently, not so much in terms of numbers of visitors, but in how institutions interact with and facilitate meaningful social action for the communities in which they work. They need to take a critical look at who they associate with and the sponsorship they receive. 
uh, as current protests in the UK at the Science Museum and the British Museum, uh, and the work of activist groups like Culture Unstained and BP or not BP are, are currently emphasizing. In addition to telling their own stories differently, they need to tell different stories. And one of our contentions in the Climate Museum's project was that actually any museum could be, be a climate museum. Uh, and some of the ideas in the exhibition and our various project outputs explore how this might be done. And finally, they need to see their role differently, not uh, as facilitators for individual and individuals and communities to catalyze and support them in taking the forms of climate action that they wish to take, rather than authorities. Every part of society will need to make radical changes to ensure global heating remains below 1.5 degrees. And this includes museums and the cultural sector. Museums could, and in many cases, are keen to play a key and a leading role in these transformations. But like all of society, they'll only be able to do so if they make significant changes to the ways in which they operate, the stories they tell and how they're told, the sponsorship they receive, and the ways in which they perceive their roles in relation to the publics they serve. So I'd like to end this talk by drawing out some general principles from these three projects quite quickly, which point to the ways in which I think heritage and museums need to be rethought and reimagined in the climate change era. Um, five points, which seems to be the number that I like in this talk. Um, so firstly, it's no longer possible, if it ever really was, to maintain the distinction between natural and cultural heritage. And here we're looking at the uh, Svalbard Global Seed Vault it's a biobank that conserves um, crop diversity in, in uh, northern Norway, in the Arctic, uh, and it's one of the case studies in the Heritage Futures book. And uh, one could look at this as a, as a conventionally as a sort of biobank bank, as something that's intended to preserve natural heritage. But obviously, it's also a biosocial archive in many ways, and it, and it, it preserves um, issues to do with particular histories of science, particular sorts of archival practices, and particular human. Uh, non-human relations that go back actually all the way to the beginning of the agricultural revolution. So we need to uh, stop thinking about natural and cultural heritage as being distinct from one another. Secondly, um, I'd suggest that, that there's a need to explore a much broader framework for understanding heritage by looking at other forms of Anthropocene legacies which tend to be less explicitly valorized such as waste, species extinction, uh, and climate change itself, each one of which is an aspect of human heritage. Thirdly, um, I would suggest, as I've been doing throughout this talk, that there is a need for heritage to engage creatively with rather than to work against inevitable forms of ecological, social and political change. Um, coastal castles will fall into the sea. Uh, lighthouses will tumble and fall um, and it, it, it's not possible for us to think that we can maintain certain kinds of heritage forever. So we need to kind of come up with new models within the sector that allow us to mourn the death of a building, um, allow us to more effectively uh, deploy resources in such situations. Um, fourthly, I think there's a, a real need to engage both heritage practitioners and broader publics in debates about the short, medium and long-term futures of heritage and the role of conservation practices in, in constructing the kind of diverse future worlds that they are beginning to imagine. So um, here we're seeing something about the work of this organisation called Revive and Restore, which is aiming to um, bring uh, woolly mammoths back from extinction uh, and the sorts of imaginaries that arise from um, the work of DNA extinct uh, and endangered DNA biobanking, you know, results directly in this sort of future imaginary. Um, and this raises a whole series of kind of ethical um, issues uh, which publics need to be engaged in debating and discussing. Uh, and finally, I just suggest that um, I see a need for more critical approaches to heritage and to doing heritage differently. So as I suggested at the beginning, many heritage professionals have taken the climate and extinction emergencies as a cue to do heritage the way that it's always been done, or at least as it's been done throughout the course of the 
from the mid-20th century onwards, um, only with more vigor and increased moral license. And I would suggest that the opposite is the case, that the climate and extinction emergencies require heritage to be done critically and that we uh, must urgently find new ways of doing it. I think I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs>